Doug Howard has taught at Calvin for 33 years. Um, and most of you know him, um, but again, for those of you who don't, uh, he teaches courses on Middle Eastern history, early world history, U.S. Middle Eastern relations, the history of India, Islam, interfaith relations between Christians and Muslims. For the last few years, he's been teaching our history research methods class, too. Um, he is a loved and valued colleague, and we are very sad that he's going to be retiring uh, at the end of this semester. Um, but we hope that it's not uh, the last time he'll be presenting because we know that he's going to stay active as a scholar. Um, as he just said a few minutes ago, he's going to learn how to use PowerPoint in his retirement. Um, so it's not really goodbye, Doug. But, um, we are sad you won't be in the lounge every day debriefing on teaching. Uh, you're a great student. We know your teachers are going to, you're a great teacher. We know your students are going to miss you. Sorry. Um, Doug's area of expertise. Um, Although it, for teaching purposes, it spans the globe, um, but for research, it's the early modern Ottoman Empire. Um, he's published a lot in this area, um, but I'll just highlight um, his magnum opus, um, which is gonna, he's going to be drawing from in this talk, um, the History of the Ottoman Empire, published by uh, Cambridge University Press in 2017. Um, it's a it's a wonderful book. It looks like a textbook. It's laid out like a textbook, um, but it's not written like a textbook. It's it's poetic. It's a wonderful read. Um, and if you haven't read it yet, I hope that this talk um, inspires you to read it or like me to finish reading it if you've dipped into it and read parts of it, but not read the whole thing from cover to cover yet. Um, so before I turn it over to Doug, just a couple of reminders about how these um, online events work. Uh, we have a chat box that you can open by clicking the little icon at the top that looks like a speech bubble. Um, and if you have a question for Doug, please type it into the chat. Either type the question or just type, I would like to ask a question and then I can call on you afterwards. Um, keep your microphones muted in the meantime. Uh, it sounds like most of you have them muted, but I can hear a little bit of background noise. When you're not speaking, please make sure you click that mute button. Um, and when Doug finishes, I'll moderate the questions, um, and I'm sure we'll have a great discussion afterwards. Um, so, Doug, please take it away. Okay, thanks everyone. It's great to see you all from parts far and near, and uh, I'm delighted to be here. As Kate said, I plan to learn PowerPoint finally once I'm retired. Um, so, you know, if I accidentally, I don't know, leave the meeting or something like that just let me back in and and please be patient i'm gonna share screen now and jenna you'll help me control that right you should be able to do it yourself so. okay and let's just go to yep. Start your let's go to the powerpoint everybody can see and hear me yep looks good yeah Doug. okay great yeah so so bert devries um you know i first came to calvin because Bert DeVries took a leave of absence to go and be the director of the American Center of Oriental Research in Amman. And I was his stand-in, meaning that I used his office. I got to look at all his books. Um, I taught his courses. Then he came back and I could stay and I got to be his colleague for 30 plus years. I learned a lot from him you know, from like how to do a syllabus, and I still do it the same way that he taught me, to, uh, how, to how to manage your anger and frustration when things go down that you don't like. And he turned his into humble action, and I tried to learn from that. So, um, yeah, I'm glad that Kate said today's talk is with him deeply in mind. All right, the Ottoman Empire after Me Too and Black Lives Matter. So what do I mean by that title? Many of us are used to thinking about um, how the past helps us understand current events, but do current events help us understand the past? Right? So uh, the publication of my book called the history of the Ottoman Empire coincided with these two movements, the Me Too movement and the Black Lives Matter movement, 
I had submitted my manuscript to Cambridge University Press end of June 2015. It went out for peer review while I worked on getting like copyright permissions and line up the illustrations. I was working with my colleague Jason Van Horn and uh, his assistant on the maps and things like that. All of that took a year and a half so that the book finally was published and appeared in print end of January 2017, just as Donald Trump was inaugurated as the 45th president of the United States. Okay, then in October of that year, the Me Too movement really began with the Harvey Weinstein allegations and uh, Alyssa Milano advocating to everyone who had experienced sexual harassment and abuse post Me Too as their status. The hashtag Black Lives Matter had actually come a bit earlier, mid-2013, in response to the acquittal of George Zimmerman in the Trayvon Martin murder. So these two movements, Me Too and Black Lives Matter, evolved together in American public life during the presidency of Donald Trump. And they might seem to have very little to do with a book on the Ottoman Empire besides the coincidence, you know, of their coming together. But now Cambridge has asked me to consider a second edition, and I've begun to wonder about that coincidence. Uh, the fact that contemporary social movements might indeed have something to do with understanding history can be seen in something like the 1619 Project, published by New York Times, August 2019. 1619 Project suggests that American history can be seen as the rise of a European empire built on African slave labor in North America. All right, so besides all that, um, another factor is that October 2019, I was contacted by Nigel Bigger of Oxford, who invited me to participate in the McDonald Center's Ethics and Empire Project. This is an interdisciplinary project. General aims are, are listed here to review the history of critiques of empire, um, you know, to gather ethical resources, to test the ethical critiques of empire against the facts, the historical facts, and then to use that to contribute to a more nuanced, historically intelligent ethic of empire. The project, they've done two workshops, one on ancient empires, one on medieval empires, and they're now going to take up early modern empires. I was brought in to help them by um, presenting to them, you know, the historical conditions and facts of the Ottoman Empire. So um, thanks to the pandemic, the conference got delayed in Professor Bigger's words. Fortunately, the importance of our topic is not time sensitive and uh, it'll live to fight another day. So it got delayed until um, this summer, and then it got delayed again. Now it's going to be in the fall. Anyway, so all of this together had me ruminating on slavery as a feature of Ottoman society. And so I'm going to use this history colloquium presentation here and, and you all as, as a way to begin to pull all my thoughts to, together on this. And uh, so here's the outline I'm going to follow. I'm, I, I want to start by giving an in introduction to the Ottoman Empire, um, briefly describing its uh, structure of governance, like its dynastic political system that re revolved around the household of the Sultan, its complex fiscal model, and its diverse culture. And I hope that by way of that background, We'll be able to understand slavery in the Ottoman Empire and and especially the surprisingly powerful role of its white concubines and black eunuchs. So let's start with this image, which is the cover image on my book. It's a painting um, by Konstantin Kapodalu, who was a Greek Ottoman painter, so Greek Christian Ottoman painter, and um, it's a, a ceremony involving Sultan Selim III, who is enthroned there in the center. And uh, it's it could be his enthronement ceremony, it could be a bayram or a festival ceremony, but anyway, it's an introduction to me to to the idea that the Ottoman political model was not democratic. The Ottoman Empire was a monarchy, and uh, for those of us today who aren't familiar with life in a monarchy, it's worth pausing to remember that um, and, and see that we don't understand what that is. What we call the Ottoman Empire was 
in, in their sense, the realm under the sovereignty of the House of Osman, the eponymous founder. And the central concept, the central political concept was the household of the charismatic conquering sultan. It wasn't a concept unique to the Ottomans. It was pretty common political fare across Afro-Eurasia in this era of steppe domination from like about a thousand uh, CE to about 1750 of the common era. The Ottomans gave this common concept one of its most enduring and important expressions. The legitimacy of the dynasty was rooted in its success, which in the steppe tradition was evidence of God's blessing and grace. And this was affirmed and substantiated through linkages between the ruling sultans and charismatic spiritual figures, Muslim saints and holy men. And in this sense, the most significant political challenges to a political system like this came from rival dynastic households. These rivals needed to project, project the same qualifications, their conqueror bona fides, their connections to spiritual charisma. So the Ottoman political structure rested on the basic social foundation of the household. Political sovereignty of the realm was vested in the Ottoman household. The Sultan, his mother, his siblings, his sexual partners, his children, they formed the core of the household. The household also included a very wide circle of other members, many, I think almost all of them, legally and formally slaves. In fact, in the early modern period, a very large number of the personnel of the Ottoman government, the statesmen, the standing army of the empire, were members of this extended Ottoman dynastic household. We might reasonably say that the people who, uh, who were slaves of the Ottoman household or had been slaves largely governed the Ottoman Empire. They formed the ruling class anyway. The two main exceptions to that generalization, one was a body of educated Islamic scholars, teachers, lawyers, judges, uh, most of the scribal officials of the Ottoman administration. They were not slaves. They were not members of the Ottoman household. They were educated in the mosque and madrasa school system. That's one exception. The other exception was the provincial cavalry army in their households. They were not members of the Ottoman household and they were not slaves. In both cases, in both these exceptions, the Sultan's household created and managed their systems of professional accreditation, salary promotion. So this household institution and its concept was replicated to a greater or lesser degree with lots of variations, permutations in lesser households across Ottoman society. Ottoman politics basically amounted to the management of relationships in and between these households. The large majority of the population of the empire and the households of the empire were common subjects, you know, with, without official distinction of race, ethnicity, wealth, social class, religious community. So just to be clear, the fundamental political distinction in the Ottoman world is not between Muslims and non-Muslims, it was between the ruling class and the commoners. Not that the Muslim non-Muslim distinction was unimportant, it was important in social life, but it, but it wasn't um, the key political distinction. And you might ask why the Ottoman sultans relied on slaves of the dynastic household to produce their dynastic heirs and govern the empire. And essentially the reason was that the political loyalty of slaves would be to their master. So the loyalty of slaves would not be compromised by any affiliation they had with a native family household and dynasty. All right, that's the Ottoman political model in a nutshell. How about the Ottoman fiscal model? Uh, first thing I'd, I'd like to say is that um, if we're going to use a term like the early modern, I, I don't, I'm, I'm ambivalent about that concept early modern. I don't use it in the book, but the Ethics and Empire Project does use it. If we're going to use it, I think one factor that marked the early modern period across Afro-Eurasia was this integration of regional networks of production and trade through the conquests and leadership of charismatic dynasties. 
And the Ottomans are one of those defining examples. So uh, the Ottoman economy was not capitalistic. Um, in the Ottoman case, between 1450 and, uh, excuse me, about 1440 and 1540, the Ottoman sultans led conquests of all the major trading centers and routes between the Danube River and the Crimean Peninsula on the north, and the Nile River and the Tigris Euphrates rivers on the south. So, what I've got pictured here are four key examples uh, using woodcut illustrations and, in one case, an Ottoman painting um, to show them. Top left, Buddha, just below the Danube bend in Central Europe, conquered 1541. Top right, Kefe, the main port of the Crimean Peninsula, terminus of the overland silk routes across Eurasia, conquered 1475. Bottom left, Cairo, at the point where the Nile diffuses into the Delta, conquered 1517. Bottom right, Baghdad, at the point where the Tigris Euphrates come closest together, it controls uh, the trade with India via the Persian Gulf, conquered 1534. So to repeat, all of the major trading centers and routes between the Mediterranean and the Indian Ocean were in the control of the Ottoman dynasty by the middle of the 16th century. Um, the Ottomans used the term for these lands, Memalik Mahruse, translated the well-protected domains or the well-protected countries. Individual provinces they called Begler Begilik. That was the area under the authority of a governor called a Begderbegi, literally commander of commanders. According to Ottoman protocols, the provinces were ordered by the chronology of their conquest by the House of Osman. Hence, they, they were structurally recognized as former independent kingdoms that had entered Ottoman sovereignty. They were governed by parallel military and civil structures. The head of the military structure was a pasha, an army officer. The head of the civil structure was a kadu, a civil magistrate trained in the Islamic legal tradition, appointed through imperial protocols. Through the military structure, each province supplied soldiers to the army under the command of the pasha, the provincial governor. Through the civil structure, each, provin each province participated like in the, in the public commercial life is managed by the magistrates. And the magistrates applied both Islamic religious law and Ottoman imperial civil law. So the, the Ottoman dynasty was Muslim, but a substantial part of the population of the well-protected countries was non-Muslim, perhaps as much as half. I mean, there were no censuses done. The first Ottoman census doesn't come till the 1880s, but even at that time when the empire had shrunk in territory and in numbers of non-Muslims, even at that time, still 25% of the Ottoman population was non-Muslim. While the population was heavily agrarian, as really everywhere in early modern Afro-Eurasia, there were vibrant urban communities with a strong commercial economy, diversity of languages and religious tradition, variety of historical regional variation and communication, was via roadways and seaways. Uh, the Ottoman economy could count on uh, several revenue sources. First, taxation, direct and indirect, uh, direct by imperial agents, indirect by, by privatized contracting, also known as tax farming, but I think revenue contracting is a more accurate term. And uh, a second set of um, revenue sources were fees for government services. A, th a third set, frankly, plunder the booty taken in war, one fifth of which legal be legally belonged to the personal treasury of the Sultan, which leads me to say that the, there were two treasuries in the empire, one the public treasury, the other the Sultan's personal treasury. And what I've got illustrated here is um, the records of cadastral surveys, which 
anticipated that taxes on the agrarian economy. And it's a reminder that extensive, voluminous records of all of this revenue collection were kept in the Ottomans' uh, um, archives. Okay, but a, a, another really important component of the overall Ottoman fiscal model was private philanthropy. This is accomplished by means of the charitable trust, Dvakf. Any person, male or female, could establish a trust of any size out of his or her estate. They had to draw up a charter stating the specific charitable purpose, its beneficiaries, the supervising staff, they had to designate the revenues from their estate that would endow the trust, and they had to register the trust with the magistrate's court. Trusts were permanent. In the Ottoman world, public property and private property were both recognized. Only privately owned property could be made into a trust. So these trusts, they ranged from massive trusts on the one hand, established by like members of the royal household. They built great mosques, soup kitchens for the poor, hospitals, asylums, bridges, aqueducts, and the like. On the one hand, on the other hand, down to tiny endowments, like to pay someone to read the Quran and say prayers over your grave. And importantly, trusts could be established with cash. And this helps explain how powerful a financial instrument the trust was. To my mind, before the rise of the joint stock company, the, the charitable trust in the Islamic world was the most powerful financial instrument available. For example, a cash trust could be established for the purpose of paying certain taxes for, for a neighborhood. The cash then could be loaned out to finance commercial ventures and the interest accrued would go to the trust. So in this way, it's, it's a very rudimentary explanation, but in this way you can see that cash trusts functioned in many ways like banks. So what, we, what I've got up here is pictured as Roxolana Hurem Sultan, the wife of Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent. She was captured, she was a slave, captured by Tatars in a raid in her native Ruthenia, brought into the Ottoman palace. She became a concubine and then the favorite concubine of Sultan Suleiman, 16th century. After she bore her first child, instead of being separated from the Sultan to raise her son as a potential heir to the throne, that was what he had always normally been done, the Sultan, his relationship with the concubine was severed after she bore a child, but, but Huram married Suleiman and moved into the palace with him and bore several more children. This transformed Ottoman dynastic practice. So pictured here are several of her trust complexes. Uh, there's a mosque in Istanbul on the left, bathhouses that, are, that stand just outside Hagia Sophia in downtown Istanbul in the center, and a soup kitchen in not Istanbul, but in uh, in Jerusalem there on the right. And her tomb pictured on the top right is in the Suleimania complex in Istanbul, very close to her husband's. Okay, the most important challenges in a fiscal model like this were the, frankly, the limited com communications technology of the early modern age. That's what really necessitated revenue collection by indirect means, it was just, beyond the capacity of early modern bureaucracies and empires to maintain like complete control of revenue collection. So the Ottomans, they experimented with several kinds of indirect collection, the most successful of which was revenue contracting. It's often criticized as, um, as inherently corrupt um, because it relied on local contractors. But what it what its benefits were, it, it brought local buy-in and investment, and it also um, risked localized control and the and the and you know the rise of locally based rivals to the Ottoman household. So the Ottoman household had to manage that. All right, that's the fiscal model. Uh, very briefly, let's talk about Ottoman culture. Man, it's hard though to, to summarize this in a couple of minutes. Ottoman culture was, you know, rose spontaneously in the climate of the times and extraordinarily difficult to, to just characterize it briefly. Um, overall, one gets the impression, I would say, of a kind of widespread commercially motivated literacy. 
the most impo imp important and popular avenues of cultural expression in my mind were poetry, clothing and textiles, including carpets, ceramics, and what I'd call the religious arts, especially chanting, singing, arts of the book, such as calligraphy. Important venues for performance included coffee shops and taverns. And I've got an illustration of one here that I think is just awesome. Um, it shows the poet Atai in a tavern talking to a learned man. And uh, I, would, I would add that uh, these poetic arts and venues crossed the divide between Islamic communities, Christian communities, Jewish communities. One other comment maybe in general, I, can, I can't, can't really go into this, but I, but I would say that Ottoman arts and literature placed value not on optimism as we do in modern times, I think, but it's, but, but the dominating emotional regime of this society in early modernity was rather melancholia. It was a melancholic embrace of the suffering and difficulties of life. That's what really you find expressed in Ottoman culture. Uh, Ottoman culture expressed the diversity of Ottoman society, including religious diversity. Um, the ruling class was Muslim, as I mentioned, but there was no expectation that non-Muslim communities should become Muslims after conquest. Um, therefore, Ottoman society was quite religiously diverse. And even to say that it's, it, it included Muslims, Christians, and Jews, it's true, but it's just far too simple. I mean, there were Sunnis, there were Bektashis, there were Kuzobash, there were Greek, Slavic, Armenian, Suryani, Egyptian, Melkite, other Arab Christians. Among the Jews, there were Karaites, Iberians, and others. There were dozens of Islamic Sufi dervish orders, Christian monastic communities, Jewish Kabbalah teachers and disciples. Just as one example, during the 17th century, controversy arose among Muslims between those who followed a kind of mystical Sufi Islamic path and those who thought that this was scandalous departure from Islam. At the same time, there was a Greek Orthodox patriarch who was scandalized because he was basically a Calvinist. And meanwhile, the Jewish communities of the empire were all in upheaval due to the alleged outrageous claims, at least alleged, as alleged by some, that Sabbatai Savi of Smyrna was the Messiah. So that's an example of the extreme religious diversity in the Ottoman world. And I also, I think I want to say that, uh, that there was a religious culture in many ways common to Muslims and Christians. Um, and Jews that, that grew out of the early modern realities of the calendar of the seasons and its festivals and the sacred calendar and also the experience of God um, as encouraged by mystical lineages and monastic communities. And, and the reality of religious diversity and difference and community conflict and concord about those things, that was a shared experience. All right, so all of that brief introduction brings us to the topic of Ottoman slavery and concubinage. I hope that there's sufficient groundwork there in the last few minutes to, to help us begin to understand this. Slavery was a universal feature of early modern Afro-Eurasia. Ottoman slavery was therefore unexceptional in the early modern world. It was embedded in the ambient culture shaped by millennia of practice. It long predated Islam, spread far beyond the boundaries of Islamic religious communities and traditions. Islam neither established slavery nor abolished it. The sacred texts don't condemn slavery as such, but Islam regulated and shaped the practices around slavery. There's a body of secondary literature on slavery in the Islamic world, a growing number of books and articles devoted to aspects of Ottoman slavery too. And here, I'm relying on the work of these scholars. This is not my own original research. 
especially I want to bring to your attention three writers whose work I've benefited by. Ehud Toledano, is the, who's pioneered work on Ottoman slavery. Professor Jane Hathaway, who's with us today, has done work on the Ottoman eunuchs and especially the black eunuchs of the Ottoman harem. And Professor Leslie Pierce, who has worked on women of the harem and her uh, recent biography, Empress of the East, is, a, is also a terrific book. Where did slaves come from? How did they enter Ottoman service? Ottoman slaves came into the Ottoman service by being captured as human plunder in war or during slave raids. The slave trade existed before the Ottomans all over Africa and Eurasia. The Ottomans joined it and participated in it. In the time period we're talking about here, the greatest slave producing regions that the Ottomans benefited from were the steppes north of the Black Sea, the Caucasus Mountains, and Eastern Africa, Northeastern Africa. Slaves from the steppe were typically trafficked through Kefe in the Crimea. Slaves from Africa came through Cairo. But also some male Ottoman slaves came through another source, the Devshirme levy of Christian boys. Especially Christian boys from the Ottoman Balkan Slavic communities, but also some Greek and other communities. In this Devshirme levy, Christian children and youths were taken in systematic recruiting trips, registered in Ottoman records, they were given clothing and funding and shipped to Istanbul. The most promising of them immediately were sent into palace training. The best of the rest were sent to the Turkish countryside where they had their first round of training and acculturation. They learned Turkish, they became Muslims. Through several years of training and periodic assessment, they were all recruited into the elite military corps of the Sultan's household, including the famed Janissaries. That's the Dev Shirme Ottoman slave institution. The view sometimes heard that slave voices are not to be found in the history of slavery or they're hard to find in the history of slavery. But in the case of Ottoman history, we are able to hear some slave voices. We have a limited number of slave memoirs. All the ones that I can think of come from very late in the Ottoman uh, Empire's history. And um, several of them, including memoirs of the eunuch Nadir Ah and the concubine Leila Hanum, were published first in serialized in newspapers in the Turkish Republic in the 20th century after the fall of the Ottoman Empire. But beyond those few memoirs, scholars have recently begun researching Ottoman estate records and judicial documents where we have the transcribed testimonies of slaves taken down by court scribes, often verbatim. And then additionally, we have some visual images including paintings and for the very late period, photographs of Ottoman slaves. The research these scholars have done have raised several interpretive questions uh, going back to Ehud Total Donald's work in the 1990s, including these, right? So Ottoman slavery and Eurasian slavery in general is sometimes alleged to have been more mild than American slavery. Is that the case? Um, in his discussion, Toledano has discussed some ancillary questions to this one, such as whether a distinction between what he called kul harem slavery and Ottoman domestic slavery, whether that's helpful or not. Uh, whether concubinage ameliorated the experience of slaver, slavery for women and gave them advantages over male slaves. Some have suggested that. Is that the case? And what about the role of race in Ottoman slavery? Professor Hathaway's work has expanded the discussion of race in Ottoman slavery. Toledano also pointed, I think a little obliquely to what, I, what, I, what one might call the unwritten rules of slavery and the, and the unremarked realities, and maybe especially as regards concubinage. And then a recent book by Betulip Shirley Argut has suggested um, what I think what I think is a really important dimension of the whole problem, the centrality of the household in any kind of interpretation of Ottoman slavery. 
So in the time remaining to us, and how much is there? It's 442. Okay. In the time remaining to us, I'd like to develop these points. All right. So first, domestic versus cool harem slavery in Toledano's term. First, some basics. Um, both Ottoman men and women could and did own slaves. In fact, even Ottoman slaves owned slaves. Slave status was not a matter of color, not a skin color, it was not passed from slave to parents to children. Um, factors in the Ottoman experience of slavery came from a, a religious ethic. For example, the Hadith that reminded people that the slave was a brother, that God could make the slave your master. In the Ottoman world, slaves were emphatically human beings. Treating one's slaves well was commended. Manumission, the freeing of, of one's slaves, that was the prerogative of the master. It was irrevocable. It was encouraged and commended as a, as a righteous deed, an act of piety. Freedom for the slave when it came was without limit, without prejudice. It raised the slave to the same status as the freeborn. Slaves could and did legally marry both female slaves and male slaves with the master's consent, and they could remarry freeborn persons. A slave's marriage was accompanied by legal manumission or freedom. A male master's sexual relations with his female slave were acceptable. Not, however, his relations with his wife's female slaves. If the slave woman gave birth, she became mother of a child, umivelet. She could not be sold, and her freedom would come on the master's death if he didn't free her before that. The children of the master and the slave woman were legitimate, and they could inherit just the same as the children born to the master's wife. Slaves were members of the household. After manumission, the parent the patron-client bond with, with the household, between the household and its slave members, remained long after the bond agenda. Such former slaves, now clients, were important in the family's marital, commercial, cultural relationships and connections. Ottoman Turkish has a rich vocabulary of slaves. I mean, in English, we're sort of stuck with the single term slave and a few others. Uh, many words for a slave were common in basic Ottoman Turkish, often interchangeable, some more frequently used than others. A male slave was köle, abid was used, esir was frequently used, a slave dealer was an esirji, female slaves were jariye or halayik, those might or might not be concubines, whereas I think odaluk basically connoted a concubine. Some words for slave might be used more broadly, such as bende, for instance, bondman. Ottoman scribes and commoners used bende of themselves in correspondence with the sultan, even though they were free men. The term kul, however, was used to mean a slave of the sultan. Toledano's distinction between what he called kul harem slavery and domestic slavery to me is warranted because with the Devshirme institution, which was the source of a great number of the Sultan's male slaves, that institution violated the Sharia in clear ways, violated Islamic law. The Devshirme involved enslaving people who were the non-Muslim subjects of the Sultan, which Islamic law would have forbidden. So Devshirme slavery was instead governed not by the Sharia, not by Islamic law, but by the Sultan's decrees. The Sultan's decrees were law, called Kanun. But this was a law of a different sort. It fell outside of Islamic Sharia. So these slaves were the Sultan's coals. This kind of slavery, this kind of autumn slavery has gotten the most scholarly attention, maybe, you know, understandably because um, it's it's easier to find documentation for this in the government source materials that survive. Also understandable because these slaves essentially govern the empire as, as at least in substantial ways. Um, 
Additionally, Betu Ipshil Argitz pointed out that because manumitted palace slaves who married and entered society at large, they became significant in the dispersion of Ottoman high culture throughout Ottoman elite society. What about concubinage and women's experience? Here, I think we have to be uh, real upfront and say we're dealing with persistent, long-standing misconceptions about Ottoman sexuality. The harem was not a sexual playground. I mean, of course, in a sense, sexuality was at the core of the Ottoman harem, just as I think we can agree, sexuality is at the core of any household, of any society throughout human history. In the Ottoman household, the Sultan's sexuality was inevitably politicized. The Sultan's sex lives were governed by the necessity of dynastic succession. I don't think it's hard to see the psychological and emotional stress involved when sexual relations have constant political implications. Leslie Pierce has, has written about that. The purpose of concubinage in Ottoman palace slavery was dynastic reproduction. The sultans typically did not marry legal wives. Hurem was the exception. Instead, they produced their children by slave concubines. And again, this was in order to eliminate the potential claims on the dynasty of a wife's family. Proximity to the Sultan brought immense power for these women and sexual intimacy, the most immense power. Because of this, the Ottoman palace, including the harem, was a highly regulated environment where strict hierarchical ranking was observed among the residents, both male and female. At the top of the hierarchy was the Sultan's mother, the Valide Sultan. Lesa Pierce has, has written that the mothers of the Sultans in her phrase were the avatars of Sultanic authority. But as Douglas Brooks has observed, each woman that the Sultan took to bed had to be provided a rank, her own suite of rooms and servants, and the right to advance in the harem hierarchy. The Ottoman harem was a training ground, an academy of higher education in the arts and sciences. The men and women of the, of the Ottoman palace were among the most highly educated people in the empire. Even those who never met the Sultan personally were not cast aside, just as the male members of the dynastic household went out to in to prepare for careers of governance and public service. So the women were prepared to contribute to this as well. Argent writes about female palace slaves, large majority of whom never shared the Sultan's bed, maybe never even met him. They, they were highly cultured women. When they were freed after a few years, they were married to Ottoman statesmen. They continued their relationship of clientage with the palace throughout their lives. They became powerful allies in their husbands' careers. It was the palace graduates, remember, both men and women, who became the ruling elite of the Ottoman Empire. The Sultan's sons were ready for real, of course, but, but, the, but the other men who came up through the system became the military, political, financial leaders of the empire. And the women, though they didn't rule directly, they exercised enormous power through their arranged marriages in high Ottoman society and through their advocacy on behalf of the children and their husbands. Betul Ipshili Argit's work has shown that like slaves throughout Ottoman society, when these women left the palace to establish themselves in their own families, their bonds with the palace endured. They were always known as Sarayi, Sarai Lu, from the palace. They carried their association with the palace and utilized and expanded the patronage links that it brought throughout their lives. They were in fact creators and keepers of Ottoman culture. Their philanthropy contributed to the development of Ottoman urban life. They were the ones who spread palace styles and tastes in the wider Ottoman society. I think it's true that earlier historical literature tended to idealize Ottoman slavery based on the experience of these Kul Harem palace slaves. What about common women slaves, those not in the Sultan's palace? We don't know how many there were. Numbers are very uncertain in all of this. Uh, but Leslie Pierce has written that the aims of slaveholding families were 
not surprisingly, to create capable servants, eventually free them, and remain in lifetime association with these clients. So Toledano has pointed out that, the, that our fascination with the reproductive capacity of slave women has obscured their productive capacity, which he thinks is the main purpose families held slaves. And one last thought here, court testimony published by Toledano strongly suggests that this fact notwithstanding, sexual harassment may have been a reality for many female domestic slaves. Toledano's evidence comes from a, a later period than we're talking about here, but it's not a, hard to imagine that the situation must have been also uh, similar in earlier eras. Coming to eunuchs, eunuchs were castrated male slaves. They lived and worked in the Ottoman palace among both the palace's female and male populations. Eunuchs became harem guards, but they also guarded young male recruits from abuse by older male palace slaves. White eunuchs served in the inner courtyard of the palace, which was a male space. Black eunuchs served in the harem, at least from the early 1600s. And here, illustrations of the two, the title of the head of the white eunuchs, Kapuasu, Aga of the Gate. Of the black eunuchs, Kuzlarasu, Aga of the Women. These men were captured and sold through the extensive slave trade networks of Northeastern Africa, speaking of the black eunuchs, shipped to Egypt, which was the richest Ottoman province. In certain Christian Egyptian towns of Upper Egypt, there were specialists in the practice of castration. They cap so the captured black men were castrated typically by having their genitals, testicles and penis both, amputated by knife. The wounds were cauterized by oil or by a method using sand pits. Survival rate estimates vary wildly in the literature. So as to say, we don't know what the survival rate was. Those who did survive either entered elite Egyptian households or were sent to Istanbul. Jane Hathaway's research has emphasized the lifelong connection of Ottoman black eunuchs with Egypt. They entered Ottoman service through Egypt and in retirement or political exile often returned to Egypt. Egypt was the financial basis of their power as well because they serving in, in the Ottoman harem in Istanbul, the harem, uh, ladies were the founders uh, or the, the, the financial backers of the Holy City's trust of Mecca and Medina and the chief harem eunuchs were their supervisors. That raises the question of race and blackness in Ottoman slavery. Was it a factor? Well, both white men and black men might be enslaved in Ottoman society, both white women and black women. Skin color was clearly recognized in Ottoman society, was a long lasting feature of an Ottoman typology of ethnicities. Um, the famous Ottoman traveler, Jadlia Celebi, for, for instance, often wrote humorously about the purported traits of various ethnic and national groups among the Ottoman subjects. Jane Hathaway's analysis sets this in the context of political domination of the empire by people from the central lands of the Balkans and what is now Anatolia. Those people were collectively called Rumi, the term for Rome that was applied to these lands of the former Roman Empire. The Rumis, people from these central lands, found themselves challenged by the influx of newcomers who came into the empire with the Ottoman conquest of the Arab lands in northern Africa. In Ottoman language, people of dark skin color were described with a range of terms. Zanj, for dark toned people, basically from sub-Saharan Africa, but, but not the Horn of Africa. Those people were Habeshi or Abyssinians. Even sub-Saharan Africans might be divided into, uh, in terms used like Nubi or Sudani. Siyah, the word for black, could be used of people to contrast with Rumi or Evladi Arab, so Arabs versus Rumi. So these distinctions of skin color were known and recognized. Um, one example that uh, George Junet gives on the basis of, of uh, evidence published by Ron Jennings 
the phrase, he's my son, this is my son. He was born to me from my black slave. So there, Sia Jaryem. Brooks thinks, Douglas Brooks thinks that in Ottoman society, generally black female slaves were typically used manual labor. White female slaves had, the, had more genteel service. I'm not sure whether that's the case or not, but his experience shows that it was. Um, the women of the Sultan's harem in Brooks's time were all white women. Black eunuchs replaced white eunuchs as harem guards in the 1600s. Professor Hathaway suggests that maybe the change was more to do with palace factions than race as we would recognize it in a 20th or 21st century term. Okay, so we've seen here that Ottoman slavery fit the universal practices of the early modern era with some specific variations. Some Ottoman slaves enjoyed the privileges of wealth and elite status. A few entered the Ottoman palace service. Ottoman slavery was shaped by Islamic religious qualifications and norms. A crucial aspect of Ottoman, of understanding Ottoman slavery we've seen was the institution of the Ottoman household. So that still leaves me wondering, is it, is it, is it we, we heirs of the American experience of slavery and racism, is it we who recognize in Ottoman slavery a basic human injustice? Was it only modern theorists you know, who see the paradox of the simultaneous marginalization of slaves and integration of slaves? Or did the Ottomans themselves recognize these things? Um, for people of the Ottoman Empire, and really for people in all the neighboring countries at the time, slavery was a fact of life, had been so from time immemorial. Yet the Islamic sacred texts treatment of the issue demonstrate that it was it was recognized by everybody that slavery if it, if if not a deplorable fact of life at least it was an unenviable dimension of the human experience right it was better to be free than to be slave um so that suggests a recognition among these early modern people including the ottomans of a fundamental injustice done to these human beings let me give three colorful examples to close where contemporary Ottoman observers noted the injustice of the situation that they themselves were embedded in. First example is a comment from the, the great travel writer Evliya Chelebi. Um, Leslie Pierce commented on this. I haven't had a chance to look at the original, but, but, but Evliya Chelebi witnessed a line of slaves on the way to market and remarked that they were so badly treated, it was wonder any of them survived the march. A second example is this painting, which comes from the Suleiman Name, um, an officially financed history of Suleiman's reign in the mid in, in the 16th century. Here we have uh, a scene from an Ottoman. Christian town in the Balkans, recognizable from its architecture. On the left, we have seated on a dais, a couple of Ottoman officials. One is writing in a, uh, a register and the other has some coins. And they are registering the slave boys who are pictured in the bottom center, already dressed in their red outfits with their knapsacks, um, over their shoulders and being um, guarded by a janissary on the bottom left, ready for the journey to Istanbul. And there's a crowd uh, gathered around it and included in the crowd is, you know, a woman and a, a Christian priest who are questioning the janissary in the center of the painting. The janissaries themselves had come into Ottoman service by this very means. And then also note the distressed woman in the center of the painting with her hands up wailing. So 
in the pathos of this painting, we see the Ottoman artist grappling with the deep humanity of the situation. Third example is a story from Mustafa Ali's Council for Sultans, um, 1581. So this is a story told by Mustafa Ali and about him, I mean, he was eloquent, but uh, one, one of these critique, critics of empire that, that the McDonald Center is really interested in. Um, and in the Council for Sultans is a kind of eloquently self-righteous screed. Okay, so in this story, the author, Mustafa Ali, is complaining about the current state of the empire. And he relates that once he was hounded by debt collectors. And the debt collectors were led by a certain Masih Pasha, who was originally from Egypt, and he was a eunuch. So the debt collectors alleged that Ali had owed several hundred gold pieces to the treasury. Ali claimed that this was all a mistake. He, his explanation was that some unnamed person had taken the money from the treasury and then signed an affidavit saying he'd loaned it to Ali. And then the guy died without either paying the money back or even informing Ali that he was on the hook for the, for, for the, for the money. That was Ali's story. I, it seems implausible to me at a certain level. But anyway, that's his story. Okay, so Ali pleads his case about the money that he supposedly owes and he says to Masih Pasha that he'd rather, that his case ought to be tried by Islamic law. And Masih Pasha, the eunuch, scoffs at him and says, what? You know, you think, did they consult Islamic law before they cut my balls off? so that I should consult Islamic law for your petty case? So these three stories all illustrate uh, the Ottoman awareness of the humanity of slaves and of, of, the, of the fundamental injustice done to them, yet they are also embedded in the society that practices this. So to circle back to my, my questions early on, can current events uh, help us understand the past? I'm seeing that yes, our, our current North American struggle in, in grappling with the legacy of American slavery does help us focus our attention on the history of slavery, slavery in earlier societies, even outside North America. It draws our attention to the human experience of bondage uh, in this Ottoman society as well. Okay, thank you very much. I'll be ready for questions. Let me escape this. Okay, thank you, Doug. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Doug? Okay, great. Um, I will wait for questions to pop up in the chat. Um, while I'm waiting, Doug, I'll just, I'll, I'll ask you one myself. Um, you, on that subject of slavery and how we think about it as modern people kind of looking for parallels or lessons perhaps for our own society, you, you posed a question in one of your early slides about whether Ottoman slavery was milder than North American slavery or European slavery of Africans. And you didn't explicitly come back and answer the question yes or no, but I kind of detected an implicit answer in a lot of the things that you said about Ottoman slavery and that in, in many ways, at least it, it was milder, maybe if, if only because it was largely domestic rather than agricultural slavery. And, and may, maybe these were, um, well, so I mean, my, my question is two parts. Am I right in, in reading an implicit answer that yes, on the whole, if, if you had to characterize Ottoman slavery as a system, which maybe is impossible to do because it was so diverse, but are, is there a meaningful way uh, of making that comparison um, to say that it was milder in some ways? And if so, are there answers for why that would be interesting to us? Do you think there are answers that are 
cultural or connected with, um, you know, even religious values or uh, ideas about race. I mean, one of the differences that struck me was the the disinclination of of, of Ottomans to kind of um, demonize slaves, identify them by color, and then kind of make them subhuman, equate them to chattel, um, which you were clearly telling us, you know, was not done the way American slave owned plantation owners did that in the in the age of liberty here. So um, it, is that a valid, you know, were you hinting towards that comparison? And if so, is there anything to learn from it? Or is that a dangerous generalization to make? So, yeah, thanks, Kate. Really, really good question. Maybe the key question, right? So I uh, deliberately did not answer whether I thought it was mild or, or not. Actually, I, I, it's different. Ottoman slavery was different than North American slavery. And I tried to point out the really key ways in which it was different. So many of the key elements that we associate with the cruelty of North American slavery are absent in the Ottoman experience. Yet, um, I agree with George Junet that we still are talking about cruelty. Um, when, you when you think about the experience of, um, of, of being captured, uh, when you think about the journey involved um, and the treatment along the way, and when you especially look at survival rates, remembering that the eunuchs of the Ottoman Palace even when they rose to the heights of power in this tremendous early modern empire, they were the survivors of a deeply cruel practice. So I don't think I want to say that it is milder. I, I, I think it's hard to compare cruelties. It's certainly different. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I, I don't see other questions in the chat yet. Um, I hope I see a lot of notifications about people who joined and left the meeting. So I hope I'm, I think I'm looking in the right place. Um, I, are people able to unmute themselves? If anybody feels more comfortable just speaking a question than writing it, I certainly want to allow that. But I'm not sure, Jenna, if they can do that or if you have kind of controlled the. the... No, people should be able to unmute. Okay. If for some reason you can't just raise your hand using the React. Um, feature and I can try to unmute you, but I think it's by individual. Okay. So if you have a, a question or, or a comment, just, you know, a, a rumination of any kind, don't be shy. Click the little microphone button, uh, two, two icons to the left, left of the big red leave button and just speak up. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to make me ask another question. It's going to get boring. <laughs> hey, hey, Doug, I, I, I have a question. Yeah, Eric, please. <laughs> I don't. I don't know if you heard me laughing uh, out loud. No, you were muted, weren't you? Yeah, I, actually, I was <laughs> muted, but you still could have heard me through through my office door. Uh, that that last the last the comment. Uh, I'm 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 concerned about. I'm, I'm I'm wondering about the the exact translation of that last statement from 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 the eunuch. Uh, <laughs> he said, yeah. Okay. They so consult the stereo. <laughs> Right, because, okay, so I, I cheated a bit there because I'm using a translation of uh, Andras Tietze, and he is very urbane, and he translates it. Did they, did they consult the sacred law when they removed my testicles? Uh, the tenor of the whole situation and Messi Pasha, however, suggests to me the stronger wording. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Con context matters. Yes, yes, yes. I saw a hand, but I couldn't see whose it was because it was next to the plus 12 number suggesting that it's... Uh, okay, I'm going to look in chat here. I see a question. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry, but Isaac. All right. Oh, now I see two. Um, hi, Isaac. How different was Ottoman conceptualization of property from the U.S.? Does that seem important for differences in the institutions of slavery? Yeah, Isaac, really good question. Um, um, it's it's hard to underestimate, right, the uh, the weight in our cultural conceptions of private property. 
Uh, yeah, so I, it certainly was different. I haven't maybe given a lot of thought to how different. Um, yeah, that's that's worth that's worth more thought for me. Thank you. Nice to see you. Craig has a question, which kind of was going to be my second question. I think about your your observations towards the end about. Um, acceptance of this institution by people who recognize its cruelty. He wants to know whether the inclination towards mel melancholy might have played into that. Um. Uh, maybe I would, this is just the top of my head, really good question. Maybe I would see it the other way around. The melancholy is a result of this, <laughs> this kind of experience, right? Um, and uh, I had another slide that I didn't want to go into about, you know, how's this practice end? So, so it, for instance, was there ever a movement of abolition within the empire? And, and my, I don't have maybe enough experience to say categorically no, but I'm not familiar with one. Um, the practice ended, you know, gradually over a period, uh, over several stages from the 1700s on. Particularly, I think it was undermined by changes in the concept of the dynastic household. And the abolitionist movement comes much later. And and frankly, from, you know, Euro-American uh, religious and cultural conceptions. Right. But I mean, that is kind of an interesting, that's another one of those big questions. It's dangerous yeah. to answer it too broadly, but it's really tempting to ask it, especially when you're teaching, you know, world history in one semester. I mean, the the melancholy, that, that whole kind of, in a way, pessimistic attitude toward life, right, is very different from the kind of enlightened, optimistic sense that, yes, yes we can make the world better and we can eliminate suffering. And, and if, if, I think that attitude of melancholia was much more common in, in Western culture too before the Enlightenment, right? You just have to, accept, you know, it goes along yes. with of a deep acceptance of sin as the reality of the fallenness of life is not something that we're going to ameliorate in this in this life. Yeah, um, I agree that, uh, you know, one of the it, basic things I learned from this, from this whole literature on uh, emotional regimes is that universally in the pre-modern period, melancholy was the universal, was, was the um, default uh, emotional regime as compared with the modern um, optimism. Yeah. Um, okay. Are you following so, Jack, Kate? Yes, I am. Godfrey okay. wants to know, I wonder if the Ottoman sense of an injustice was more concerned with, that's kind of the question that, that you just answered, I think, right? <laughs> uh, more concerned um, the act of enslavement rather than the status. Well, it's a, that's a slightly different question. You want to address that? Whether the um, whether the guess. sense of an injustice was more concerning the act of enslavement rather than okay. the status, in other words, was the cruelty becoming rather than being a slave? Yeah, yeah, really good question. Um, maybe that's maybe that's a helpful distinction. Um, I don't, you know, I don't remember very many people actually writing about it. The Ottoman struggle, you know, emotional struggle with the whole issue of slavery. Uh, and typically, I think I think the evidence suggests typically Ottoman slavery didn't last long. So a few years before manumission was, you know, was was given. So maybe that's a dimension of it too. Um, yeah, good. The examples I gave all seem to indicate that really we're talking about the initiation into slavery the lament about falling captive during war or being captured by the Tatars in a raid or something like that, right? Or by slave traders and carted off for castration. Right? Right. Um, so the only other question I see in the chat, uh, there are two, two comments. One is a thank you and goodbye from Jane Hathaway and a thank you from Craig. But John Meyer asks um, about the Vakif. You talked a little bit about yeah. this early on. Could you speak a little bit about the historical origins of this and how widespread it was? Yeah, really good question. So uh, that's a huge topic. Um, Vakf um, is an Islamic religious concept that originated, as far as I understand, in, in the Middle Ages, 10th, 11th centuries, especially um, was used by um, powerful Muslim 
monarchs in creating institutions. For example, the institution of the Madrasa in higher learning was, uh, was as far as I know, um, an outcome of this kind of financing, this kind of financial model. So it's uh, defended on Islamic grounds, um, not entirely uncontroversial, but comes in comes in the Middle Ages and and in this period, in I think there's a Safavid equivalent, there's a Mughal equivalent, were you know was the most the most powerful financial instrument used to build um, to build capital. I think you would say in the Islamic in Islamic Afro Eurasia. I see something from Gottfried. Uh, I wonder if the Ottoman sense of an injustice of slavery was more. Oh, that's the one. Hey, that's okay. the one you answered. Yeah, that's Gottfried. That's I, a great question. <laughs> you want to take a second stab at it, or <laughs> no, no, Gottfried okay. can answer it better than me. No. All right, Chad has one. Um, is it your sense that the notion of the possibility of up to a million Western European slaves entering the North American world is likely overstated, i.e., like the story of? the Icelandic captive. Wow, I don't know anything about numbers. Um, and Eric might might know about the whole debate about numbers in North, North America. I, 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 I don't think that question is in the very primitive stages of being answered in the Ottoman world. Um, we just have such wildly varying estimates about numbers, mostly coming from European observers in the Ottoman world. But I, 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 I just am not able to answer that about the numbers of American slaves. Wait, I don't think he means American that. slave. He means enslaved oh. Europeans, right? In the, in the Mediterranean and. Oh, 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 oh. I, I think being enslaved by Ottomans. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I just think that the, that the, the, the evidence does not enable us to even begin to estimate how many were enslaved, right? And and remember, when we use a term like Europeans, be self-conscious, one third of Europe was the Ottoman Empire. And also remember that this is a, a, a universal Afro-Eurasian slave trade in which Turks also were enslaved, Russians were enslaved, Africans were enslaved, Venetians were enslaved, and so on. It's not it's not something only the Ottomans were doing to Europeans. Yeah. It, it's also worth remembering that it was often a temporary status too, right? So you had people like Miguel de Cervantes being a slave for five years right. in North Africa and then being ransomed and then going on to, you know, have a, <laughs> have a, a prosperous life for many more decades. So it's not quite the same thing. I mean, any, anybody who might be trying to compare that to the African slave trade, you know, would be, it's, it's not just a question of numbers, it's a question of the nature of the. And I take that to be the, what's behind the Hadith, you know, remember the slave could become your master. It's, it's such a topsy-turvy world. Really, any person ran the risk of being enslaved if the Tatars came and raided your village, you know. Yeah. Well, I guess you're saying in a nutshell, the, 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 Istanbul, the sort of the central sources don't really shed much light on what might be happening uh, in. Go ahead, Jed. I, I got Chad the got first cut part off of that. at the end. Oh. So the, I think you're asking about the the nature of the source materials. Yeah, they don't really mm -hmm. give us numbers. The Ottoman uh, cadastral records, for example, they count households. They don't count people and uh, slaves don't appear there at all. I mean, in the, in, in the counts. Thanks. I think I see one more question um, that sounds like an excellent question for you to end on because there's a lot of uh, choice here for how you want to answer it. And that's from someone named Phyllis who says, are there lessons we can learn from the Ottomans? Yeah. Uh, I think the yeah. answer isn't allowed to be no. <laughs> for for sure, right? So that, yeah, the question I was asking at the outset: Can um, can our experience inform us about the historical past? But then the, also the question: Can the historical past inform us about to, today? Um, I think we can say that from from the Ottoman experience that humans are really well practiced at 
inflicting each other with great cruelties. And um, they help us, I think, lament the cruelties of our own times that we inflict on others, sometimes unintentionally, other times with full knowledge. The Ottoman experience helps us see the sadness and the pain of that. Yeah, thanks for the question. Thank you. Well, if I have missed anyone who wanted to talk, now's your chance to just shout out and ask one final question. Um, otherwise, let's just all thank Doug for a wonderful and stimulating presentation. Thank you. Thank, thank you all. Thanks for the chance to, to, talk, to talk through this. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Doug, and thank you all very much for coming. All right.